Morning Grace Fellowship. Uh, My name is Sammy Whitehawk, uh, for those who don't know me. And uh, what I get to do is I get to preach the gospel to you guys. And so if you're new to Grace Fellowship or you're new to church, that's something we long to do each and every week is just preach to you this gospel over and over again. And that word means good news. It's the story of Jesus Christ, his life, his work. And one thing we just sang about, what a beautiful song, is he is alive today. So that's something we rejoice in, and that's, that's what we're here for. So if you've got, you got a Bible in front of you, you've got a phone, whatever you're using, um, take the time now to turn to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 22. And so that's a, a New Testament book written by Luke. Uh, use the table of contents if you need to. But uh, Acts 2.22 is where we're going to start. And so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you a little bit of context here to, um, to help, you know, get us all on the same page because it is a series and it is a book um, where Peter is, is building into something here. We're in the middle of, of a sermon by the Apostle Peter and we're actually doing part two of the sermon. And so the best way for a lot of you guys to get caught up in this series, which I highly recommend you do, is just go uh, go online, listen to Murray's messages, because I just, I can't do uh, them justice. But they're going to explain really the context of where we are in the book of Acts, and uh, also where we are in Peter's message. So we're in Acts 2, and what has happened is Jesus has just, in the beginning, he ascended into heaven, and he left his apostles, his disciples, with this promise that he is going to empower them. He's going to empower them by the Holy Spirit to be witnesses of Jesus Christ, and they're going to go to the ends of the earth with this message, this testimony. But in order for them to do that, they needed to wait. They needed to pray. And then in this amazing act of God's grace, his spirit was poured upon all the um, apostles of Christ at, and the disciples. And so you had this amazing moment where the spirit came on the people and the spirit stayed. Because anytime you read the Old Testament, when God empowers his people, whether that be kings or prophet, it's only for a time. It's for a season never um, to stay. However, God had promised in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament scriptures, that there would be a day where God's Spirit would be poured out upon his people and God's Holy Spirit would stay with the people. So here we are, the people are coming together and they're asking, what is this? How can this be? Because the moment that um, is going on here, it's Pentecost and there are thousands of Jews gathering in the city of Jerusalem. So they hear in this moment that um, these people of different tribes and and tongues, they're all Jews, but they speak different languages. They're all proclaiming the mighty works of God and they can understand one another. So you got this glorious moment in history and they're asking, "What, what is going on? So Peter, the apostle, he stands up in front of the group and he begins to explain and he opens up you know, I, I don't know what they had, a scroll or whatever it was, or just by heart. But he says, this is in fulfillment to the prophecy that Joel had made. Joel was an Old Testament prophet. He said, this is what is, would happen in the last days. God would pour out his spirit. So saying that now, today, since Christ has come, it is now the last days. And the spirit would be poured upon a people of God. And then verse 21, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And what a promise that salvation is now made available. So what we're going to do is if you're in Acts 2.22, uh, we're going to watch the, uh, the scripture video on the screen for our passage today. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 22 to 36. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, 
for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we all are witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Okay, uh, I want to start. Let's just, let's pray. Uh, Father, I ask that you would just um, use me, God, in my weakness. Would you just help me um, just speak your truth? Lord, may it be clear. And uh, Father, I just pray that um, our hearts would be transformed once again by this good news. Pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, I, I just got a quick question. When it's cutting out, can you guys still hear me, or is it going mute every time it does that? You can, you can still hear me? But, okay. Well, we got two batteries, so we're going to go ahead and uh, continue on, and we'll see. Well, hopefully, Lord willing, it all works out. Um, yeah, so God is good. Here we are. We're in Acts chapter 2, um, and we got this moment where Peter is standing up. And we've got to remember who Peter is. Peter is the apostle. He was the one, he was very bold and brash, but yet at Christ's weakest, darkest moment, Peter abandoned him and Peter denied him before a young, uh, a young woman. But here we have Peter standing up in front of thousands of Jews and he's going to preach once again, this Jesus. So verse 22, men of Israel hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and signs and wonders that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. So in order to explain what is happening, he starts out with the prophecy of Joel, doesn't mention the name of Jesus, but then we get here and he brings up Jesus of Nazareth. So for a lot of us, we know what has happened. You, you've heard the story of who Jesus is and what he did. But I want you to take a moment to understand the context of what's going on here and who the listeners are. Because for him to say Jesus of Nazareth, we got to remember that just weeks earlier, he was crucified. So he, Peter, begins by saying Jesus of Nazareth. This man that you guys knew. At this point, all these Jews, everyone would have heard of Jesus. He was very uh, popular and, and sadly very polarizing because you had people that hated him and people that loved him. And so he did many miracles, many mighty works that, that uh, news had traveled throughout the, the kingdom, throughout Israel and, and beyond. And what you also had... Um, was just this testimony, these large groups of people gathering to hear Jesus speak and to see what he would do. So everyone knew who this Jesus was. But also at this point, everyone would have known and heard of Jesus' humiliating and horrific death on the cross at the hands of the Romans. So that's why Peter starts with that connecting Connecting point, remember Jesus of Nazareth. Because I want to emphasize something here. He's referring to him as, as a person. Because we got to remember, first and foremost, this isn't uh, a myth that we've made up as Christians or a fairy tale. But this belief, this faith that we have is rooted in history. And Jesus was a person. He's a historical person documented by both believers and unbelievers. Jesus of Nazareth. So he was the man, he had a beard, he had a postal code or whatever it was, but he, he lived in, in a small town, he grew up, people knew him. This Jesus 
of Nazareth. So where we are now, he, he was a man. And so I want to emphasize something that we believe as, as Christians is we know and we believe that Jesus was fully human. We just sang about it, but God became flesh. That's the joy of the incarnation where God took on human flesh. He was born to a virgin. He was a baby. He grew up just as all of us have, have done in our lives. Jesus was a human. But also, Peter is here right away. He's able to remind them of, of Jesus' ministry. He did mighty works. God did amazing things through him. And he uses this word, attesting. Basically, testifying to them that God had endorsed Jesus Christ. So if I say a test, it may not mean the same thing, but an endorsement would mean a lot. For those of you, maybe you're following the, the U.S. election. I find it quite humorous, but... Um, Recently, and if you really want to kill and laugh for a good three to five minutes, watch the highlights of, of Sarah Palin endorsing Donald Trump. See, so that's, when I hear endorse, that's what I think, but you got to understand this isn't, you know, goofy people making backdoor deals, but this is the God of heaven and earth. The one is saying, this is my son. This is the one. It's God attesting and endorsing Jesus as the Messiah that we'll get to. So God had been doing it through mighty works, and they have heard of that. But as I said, they know Jesus' tragic ending. It was, it was um, news. It was probably old news at this point. Jesus of Nazareth is dead. He was murdered. So it's hard to believe all that Jesus taught, that he was the long-awaited Messiah that the people of Israel were hoping in. He, it's hard to believe he's the chosen one of God, it's hard to believe that he was the one to bring salvation to Israel and defeat all his enemies. It's hard to believe that he was going to be mighty and triumphant when Jesus was crucified and murdered in just this horrible spectacle. It's hard to believe in that guy. That's why there weren't large crowds following Christ gathering in his name. They're gathering for a holy holiday for Pentecost, continuing on as is, because it must not have been that guy. He died. And here's what I want to do is um, there's a, we're, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 5 and let's look at what uh, Gamaliel, um, I don't know if I'm saying that right, but he's a, he's a prominent rabbi in, in the book of Acts and he's actually the, um, the teacher of, of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. Remember, he's not a believer um, and so he taught Saul before Saul became the apostle Paul and wrote half the New Testament. So here's the context. You'll see it all throughout Acts. Apostles are preaching Jesus Jews want to put him to death, and here we are. So, verse 35, And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, uh, Thutis rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too, like Jesus, perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. So remember, this is an unbeliever talking here, and this next line, this is worth the price of admission. Um, by the way, if someone did charge you for admission, you got ripped off by someone. Probably not in this church. <laughs> I don't see anyone wearing 3D goggles. That's the ultimate sign. You, you don't have to pay to be here. Anyway, let's pay attention, guys. Um, here's what he says. For if this plan, this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them you might even be found opposing God. What prophetic words. And remember, he didn't believe in Christ. He's just saying, look, there's been movements in the past. There's going to be movements in the future where you have very charismatic leaders being able to draw up crowds. 400 people is a lot of people. To draw up a crowd and say, I am somebody. But he, just like everyone else in history, will die. And movements... They, they do rise and they do fall, but if it's God's work, you won't be able to stop it. 
you can try, but you will not be able to overthrow them. And I love that because that's the story of the early church. Right? You got these weak men gathering. They're poor, but yet they have the spirit of God and it's, it's God building his church. So that's why I wanted to use this, this passage for, for us today because the Jews were used to seeing men come along, but as soon as they died, they're done. It's over with. So the crowds in Jerusalem, that's when they're hearing Peter speaking right now, they, that's what they must be thinking of. Because Peter reminds them, yeah, remember that guy? He died. But there's something different about this one. The death of Christ was not God's plan B. We know it from scripture, and Jesus said it over and over again, that he would die, that he would go to the cross. And here's what Peter says, verse 23. This Jesus, remember, Jesus of Nazareth, he was delivered up according to the death definite plan and foreknowledge of God. And so that's good news for us as as believers, that his death wasn't an accident. We know that was the very climax of history where you had the son of God take on our sin and die in our place, place, bearing the wrath of God that we deserved. Jesus did that. And Peter reminds all these Jews who are gathered here that this was no accident. It was God's very purpose. God sent Jesus to the cross. He reminds them of their responsibility in it, both the Jews and the Romans. But it was God who sent Jesus to the cross. And Jesus went willingly. What an amazing God that we served. But he reminds them again, you crucified and killed by the hands of of lawless men. So Peter wants them to know this Jesus is different than any other person who has been risen up, any other prophet who has spoken on behalf of God. And here is the astonishing and amazing truth that Peter wants them to know. In verse 24, he says that God raised him up God rose Jesus from the dead. If there was ever an endorsement of Jesus being God's son and of Jesus being the Messiah, this is it. The resurrected king, he brought him from the dead. He rose him up. And I love this language. He was loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. All throughout, ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, death has been our greatest human enemy. We could not defeat death. We were hopeless and bound to, to, to perish. That is what happens for us because of sin. As a result, Romans says, the wages of sin is death. But then you have Jesus, the glorious son of God, come and take on human flesh. He dies in our place and God rose him up, signifying that death has been defeated. And that's good news for us because that is our hope that God raised Jesus up. And all oh, you can imagine hearing that you're a Jew and your whole life you've heard of the Messiah and you never thought he would die. And Peter says, Jesus of Nazareth is that man. And God rose him up. Oh, I just love this. He's reminding them the Messiah has come. And it is Jesus. But for the Jews, they would struggle. They would always struggle because they did not think that the Messiah would die. They, they could not see how this would be a part of God's plan. When Paul describes the Jews and preaching the gospel, he says in Corinthians, we preach Christ crucified, and it's a stumbling block to the Jews. A lot of them, they, just, they can't get past it. A Messiah who dies. And so here we go in verse 25. Peter wants them to know that this was all part of God's plan. He writes, for David says concerning him. I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh will also dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence." 
So here, Peter's quoting David. Now, um, in the Old Testament, David is a king in Israel. He was a man after God's own heart. He was, um, for those of you guys you know of Mount Rushmore, you know, for the Old Testament characters and, and people who, who are there, he'd be on that. You know, he's a big deal. And so what Peter does is he quotes King David, and he says, David, who wrote many of the Psalms that we have in our Bible, he said, David actually spoke of Jesus. He makes that connection to say this was God's plan all along. That the greatest king, and this is a quote from Psalm 16, he actually spoke of that. And the key verse is verse 27. You will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Now, when I read the Old Testament, I often will have to read with with some sort of um, study Bible or something just to, to help me clarify. Because Jesus says the Bible is all about one person. It's all about him. And sometimes I don't always see that. So what I love is that when New Testament authors, full of the Holy Spirit, inspired by him, interpret the Old Testament authors who are inspired by the Holy Spirit to give us an explanation as to what what is David speaking of here. So that's what Peter gets to. Verse 29, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David, that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. So being therefore a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he, and this is David, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that is the Messiah, the one to come, and that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So Peter makes it clear that that Psalm 16 was not and could not be referring to David himself. David at this time, and uh, you can argue, you know, what seat of authority is highest right now. Um, You know, you could say the president of the United States or the Pope or whoever, but there is an earthly seat uh, of of power. And at this time in David's um, kingdom and in the history where he has peace and he's winning victories over all his enemies, David was, was the highest seat of authority. And yet David recognizes someone beyond himself. And he says, the Christ, he would not, um, he would not be abandoned to Hades and his flesh would not see corruption. David foresaw this. And David is al- always referred to as, as a king in the Old Testament. But here, Peter calls him a prophet saying he spoke uh, God's truth and God's message at that time. And so that's what's really interesting here. You have David saying, yes, the Messiah would be resurrected. The Messiah would not be bound to the grave. He would not stay dead. He would never perish. And remember, David, in the Old Testament, God had made a covenant promise with David. God had said something. I want to take a look at that in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And we're going to do a bit of reading here. But David was so assured of, of Psalm, this, this passage in Psalm 16 because he knew God had made that promise that one of his descendants would be on the throne. So 2 Samuel 7, here's a little bit of, of the context here. David is kind of at his prime as a king. He's, he's relaxing in his palace. He's praying. He's worshiping God. And he realizes, man, I got it good here. But God, you know, the Ark of the Covenant where God would meet his people, God's still dwelling in a, in a tent. And David thinks, you know what? I want to build a house for God. I want to do that for him. They're very noble intentions. But here's what God says. Actually, God's going to build David a house. It's God is going to do the building. So 2 Samuel 7, 12. This is God speaking through the prophet Nathan. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers. So reminded once again, David would die and he would stay dead. So the Messiah would not be David. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And I want you to picture, because in the Old Testament, there was always a short fulfillment 
And so in this case, it would be David's son, Solomon, who would fulfill many of these things. But ultimately, God is speaking beyond Solomon to the day when Jesus would come. Because the New Testament says that all the promises of God are fulfilled in Christ. And so we see Jesus here. His kingdom is forever. And Jesus always referred to God as a father. And Jesus was a son. And it says, when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rods of men and the stripes of the sons of men. And here we have this image. We know Jesus was sinless. He never committed sin. But yet on that cross, God poured out his wrath on the sins of us. The sins of men were poured out upon Jesus. And Jesus was punished as though they were his very own sins. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. And so as you read the book of Acts, you can see this prophecy, this covenant that God had made with David being fulfilled in the very church of Christ, as Christ is the fulfillment of everything, and he is on the throne forever. His kingdom would be made sure forever by God. And God said, I will build you a house. And remember what he's speaking of, a house or a temple. Really, he's getting to the place where God's presence would dwell, where God would be with his people. And what does Paul say? We are as believers in the New Testament. We are a house. We are a building of God. God is forming his church here. Very early on, the spirit has just been poured out. And God is building his house where he would dwell with his people. That is us, the church. And you see this fulfillment. You see this growth throughout the book of Acts. God building his house. So we saw the short-term fulfillment. And you see David here speaking of Christ. And Peter wants to remind these Jews who are gathered that Jesus is the fulfillment of all these things. He is the one who... um, who came, and he is the one whose throne has been established forever. So that's exciting for us as believers. So let's get back to Acts chapter 2, verse, verse 32. Peter goes on and just reminds him of the good news of what has just happened. Remember, Peter, weeks earlier, the coward. Now, Peter, the bold, empowered by the Holy Spirit to say, this Jesus of Nazareth, this Jesus God raised up. He rose him from the dead, and of that we are all witnesses. Because he got the apostles standing there with him. And remember, if Jesus was just crucified weeks earlier, what, uh, what could happen to them for them to stand up in front of thousands of people and to say, you know what? We're standing with Christ. We're standing with Jesus because we are witnesses that God rose him from the dead. They're now empowered and they're emboldened to proclaim Jesus is alive. It's the same hope that we have today, that Jesus is alive. But they were fortunate to see him. It was a physical, bodily, resurrected Jesus that God rose from the dead. And they did a complete 180 and they're willing to stand and and die with him and proclaim the good news that we saw him, we're witnesses, and we can no longer deny that it was God who endorsed Jesus of Nazareth and he is here. So Peter goes on, verse 33. And so remember the context of this whole sermon is how can this be? How can the Holy Spirit be poured out upon the people now And Peter says, it's not because they're drunk, but it's in fulfillment to the old covenant prophecies. Being therefore exalted, verse 33, at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this, that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. So Peter sums up and says the reason the spirit is being poured out today is because Jesus is alive and he's at the right hand of the Father. Because God resurrected Christ, not just to stay on earth, but he exalted him to the highest seat of authority in all of the universe. Jesus was risen to the very right hand of God. And Jesus was given the authority to pour out his spirit on his people. That's why this is happening. The kingdom is here. And 
Peter is saying it's all because of Jesus. And I just love this beautiful image of our triune God here. Because you got to remember, in the Old Testament, the Jews, just like us as believers, knew that God was one. The Old Testament says it over and over again, monotheistic. There is only one God. But we know the scriptures tell us it's one God, but three persons, equal and yet distinct, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And look at verse 33 again. Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God, the Father, and he has received the promise of the Holy Spirit. You see our God, just this amazing imagery that all of salvation and all that is happening is from God, and it's of God, of God alone. So verse 34, for David did not ascend into the heavens. Remember, um, David died. But he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. So it's a, a quote from Psalm 110. It's a little bit confusing, but this explains that there are two persons here in this passage, the father and the son. Remember David, the highest seat of authority, and yet he called this person Lord. And he said, my Lord, he said, how does he say it? My Lord says to my Lord. And this is something Jesus liked to use um, to explain to the people. How is it that a descendant, a son of David, is yet the one that David called Lord? Uh, Mark twelve thirty five. Jesus says this, um, David himself calls him Lord. So this title, Lord, it really, um, in the Old Testament, a lot of times it was um, translated from Hebrew as Yahweh. And this word just explaining explicitly, this is God. A lot of times, Lord would be referred to as, as God and God alone. And David calls this person Lord. David, the highest seat of authority. And so here we have Peter in, in Acts chapter 2. He is letting them know that Jesus is not only the Messiah, the promised one to rescue and redeem Israel, but he is also Lord. Jesus of Nazareth, that man you all knew, he is both the Christ and he is God. He's Lord. Uh, so I just let, I'll let Peter say it. Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So here is kind of the, the final moment of, of his message where he drives it home. Jesus of Nazareth, the one attested to you by many mighty works. God rose him from the dead and God exalted him to the highest seat on the throne. He is both the long awaited Messiah. He is the Christ, but he is also fully God. He is God to whom David calls Lord. He is the God who has the authority to pour out the Holy Spirit upon the people of God. This Jesus, and he reminds him again, whom you crucified. What terrifying news. Generation after generation, they were waiting for this person to come. They were waiting for the Messiah, and they find out he came, and we killed him. Oh, what heartbreaking news. And so when Murray preaches next week, he's going to get to the reaction of the people, because killing and crucifying the Messiah, who is God over all the universe. That is the greatest crime, the greatest sin, the most horrific thing to be guilty of. And Peter says, you, you are guilty of that. And so what I want to point out here is that not all the Jews were in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' death. Most of them probably weren't. And yet he's saying, you guys are responsible for Jesus' death. How could that be? And here's what I want to point out and what I want to get to is the reason they are responsible for Jesus' death is not simply because they are of Jewish descent. That's, that's too simple. What he is saying is by rejecting Jesus as God's endorsed Messiah, 
rejecting Jesus of Nazareth, God's chosen one, who is both Lord and Christ, is to be guilty of crucifying the Holy Son of God. And so that still stands today. That for those of you, if you're not a believer here today, that same sin is still attributed to your account as being guilty. You weren't there, that's 2,000 years ago. You may not even know him, but to reject Jesus as the Lord and the Christ is the greatest sin to commit. There are only two ways that sin is paid for. It's either paid for by Jesus on the cross when our amazing God died in our place and took our sin and our wrath and judgment. He took that there on the cross. Or you take it on yourself and spend an eternity under God's wrath and hell because that is the wages of sin. It's eternal death. But there is hope. And that's what's amazing about this. Peter could have said, and you guys, you're in trouble. right? There's no hope for you. You killed Christ. But the whole message of the gospel is that God's mercy is available. God's grace has been poured out. Now is the time to repent to turn from sin and to turn to God. Now is the time where you can submit your life to Jesus, the the Holy One of God. He is both the Lord and Christ. And so this is the the good news of, of Christianity is that we have a Savior, Jesus, who was a historical person, fully human. He goes to the cross he dies for our sin and God raises him from again, from, from the dead. And he raises him and exalts him to the highest seat. He's on the throne forever. And this message is still out there for you and for your children and for all people to all ends of the earth. Now is the time of repentance. Now is the time where you can embrace God as both Lord and Christ of your life. And you can um, believe in him and trust in him and love him and follow him. Turn to Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Because they're going to ask the greatest question you could ask. What must we do? If we're guilty of killing the son of God, what do we do? Because we are hopeless. We messed up. And Peter offers this amazing, gracious gospel before them. And says, you can turn to Christ you can follow him. You can love him. Um, there's a verse in Philippians 2, and I just love this image. Uh, Philippians 2, verse 9. Paul writes this, Therefore, God has highly exalted him, this is Jesus, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Just the whole Bible affirms that it's just Jesus on the throne. He is both Lord and Christ. Any questions? No questions. Well, I didn't set my timer, so I don't feel guilty about going a little later right now. Um, But here's what I want to do. I just want to just affirm once again, I hope, you got the take-home sheet with my outline on there. I can tend to veer a little from that. But here's the whole point. The Christian faith hinges on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what our hope and our faith is built on. Because remember when I quoted from Acts chapter 5, if Jesus was just another guy who, who died, he's dead. It's over. And I can't remember who it is. I think it's Josh McDowell. But there's a saying, Jesus was either a liar. So he knew he wasn't the son of God. And he actively deceived people. He's either a lunatic. So he was crazy. He thought he was someone. And he goes to his his grave insane. Or he was who he said he was. He is Lord. He is God. And that's what we believe in here today. So you don't have this fairy tale belief in in something that may have happened. You believe in a historical person who God rose from the dead. So I want to close with something in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, because this is Paul explaining what we believe in as as Christians. So 1 Corinthians 15 verse 1, Paul says, 
I remind you, brothers, of the gospel. So remember, I said that's what we're here to preach and proclaim each and every week. The gospel that I preach to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. You never get past the gospel. So if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, he says, I deliver to you of first importance. If you're going to believe in something, it is this, that Christ, so Jesus, died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, once again, in accordance with the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas and to the 12, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Here's what Paul is saying just years after the death and resurrection of Christ. He's saying Jesus, the physical um, body, the physical person, the God of the universe appeared to people and they saw him and they touched him and they ate with him. This is foundational to the Christian belief. And for him to say there's even appeared to 500 people and you can even go and talk to them because many are still alive. This is very recent and it's powerful and foundational for us. And 1 Corinthians 13, here's Paul's argument. He's arguing that there will be a resurrection of the dead. Because he says, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We, so the apostles and those who preach God's gospel, are even found to be misrepresenting God. Because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom um, he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, um, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. He's saying, this is how foundational the resurrection is. You can't lose the resurrection and still have the gospel. He says, if Christ didn't raise from the dead, you are hopeless and still in your sins. Your faith is futile. It's made up, it's imaginary, and it's getting you nowhere if Christ did not rise. But we believe this. And he says, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. Those believers who lost their lives for Jesus, they're still dead and they have no hope. And he says, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are to be most pitied. Here's why. The Christian life demands all of you. All of you. God says you are to love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. You are to give up everything and submit all of your life to Jesus as he is Lord in Christ. The Christian life is hard. It is difficult. We make sacrifices. You'll be mocked and ridiculed by family members and co-workers. We have many brothers and sisters around this world who are losing their very lives for this gospel. And Paul says, if Christ didn't rise from the dead, oh, they are to be pitied. What a waste of life. But here is the good news. But in fact, especially for those of you who like facts, Christ has been raised from the dead. That means that everything that God had said about him, everything that Jesus proclaimed is true because Jesus has been risen from the dead. And that is the foundation of our faith. And that is the hope that we have, that we have a savior, one who intercedes for us on the throne, Jesus, who is both Lord and Christ. So, so that's all I have for you. I'm going to call up Kevin and uh, he's going to lead us. Where is he? Is he even in here? Okay. So Kevin's going to lead us in the Lord's table. But guys, I love you. And I know this wasn't a perfect message, but if you take anything away from this, it's that Jesus rose from the dead and he is alive. And that is such good news because that means for the believer, your sins are forgiven. For those of you who are trusting in Christ this very day for salvation, you have a hope that is not in this life only, but you have a hope that is eternal. You have a hope in Jesus Christ and he will fulfill all his promises. He is good and faithful. So thank you guys.